We are going to be in Joshua chapter 2, if you want to start turning over there. And really, Joshua is a book that has a lot that we can learn from. Uh, there's a lot there that we can understand, that we can grow in our faith through reading and studying the book of Joshua. One of the things that really is evident is it's a, it's a book of transition and change and struggle, and we can learn a lot from those kinds of experiences from the people in Scripture because I know in my own life there are times where I am going through periods of time that are just periods of life of transition or struggle, hardship, and difficulty. And so to have those kinds of experiences described in the Bible for biblical historical figures it's beneficial for me and for us so that we can learn how to better approach those times in life. I think for the most part, our human experiences will go through periods of transition and difficulty and struggle, and then we'll come into a period where things are a little better for a while, and then we go back into a time of transition and struggle and difficulty, and then eventually, it's kind of an ebb and flow kind of thing in life for most of us. And so this is really beneficial for us because it helps us when we go through those times. Regardless of how long they may be or how often they may come, it's beneficial to know how to approach them and what we can learn and how we can grow through those times. And so Joshua is really helpful in that. And so as we started out this morning, you guys discussed surprises and the best surprise that you've ever had. Uh, I'm not going to share with you probably the best surprise, but it's a really good one. It's one that uh, really kind of threw me off to start with. Uh, and ended up being a huge blessing for me. And it was when I was given the opportunity to pursue my master's degree. Um, the college that I attended for my undergraduate degree was at the time, it's now accredited, but it was not accredited at the time. Uh, it's uh, now Summit Christian College. It was called Platte Valley Bible College. It's right here in the area. Uh, it's in Gearing now off of U Street. It was in Scotts Bluff on the corner of 3rd Avenue and 16th Street. Uh, we would uh, walk around downtown. There was actually, for a while there, it was a great spot, but now it's gone. Um, now there's, uh, I think in the same location that this place used to be, is now Sam and Louie's Pizza. But there was, at one point, a tortilleria on that street, right in that location. And we would, every Tuesday, for Taco Tuesday at this tortilleria, would walk down the street, down 16th Street, to this location after school was done. And we would grab lunch at the tortilleria and just have tacos. And during Lent, they would be fish tacos. But they were the best tacos. They were awesome. Uh, and we loved going down there. It has nothing to do with the surprise. But uh, unaccredited schools make it a lot of times more difficult to go into a uh, graduate program. And so I had never actually anticipated getting my master's degree. It was something I kind of had thought about and wanted to do, but never really put much thought into how I would approach that or, or getting it done. And so uh, a few years ago, I was approached by uh, my boss, and he said, hey, uh, why don't you apply for this master's degree program? I uh, would really love for you to be uh, involved with it. I think it would be beneficial to you. I think you would enjoy it. Uh, and I said, okay, uh, I'll do that. And I looked into it. Before that, and I had talked to the guy who at that point was overseeing the entire program. Uh, he ended up transitioning out before I went into the program, but I was talking to him about it and I told him that I didn't think I'd probably get accepted to the program because I had an undergraduate degree from an unaccredited school. And he said, oh, you, won't, you don't have to worry about that. We'll look at all that. We weigh all those things, but it's not necessarily the only factor. So I'd love for you just to apply. And so at that point, I didn't. Uh, but when my boss approached me about it, I went ahead and, and applied. And so I went into it with the idea that if I got accepted, then I would know, and that was how I was praying, I would know that that was the direction God wanted me to go. And if I didn't get accepted, then it was just not what God had planned for me. Uh, <clears throat> don't need a master's degree to do what God has called me to do. Uh, as evidence of that, you can just look at the New Testament church when it got started. Uh, started by a bunch of fishermen and, and guys that didn't have a lot of formal education. Uh, so <clears throat> I wasn't too worried about it, but I went ahead and applied. And the first response I got back was that I had not been accepted, but was on the waiting list for this particular cohort. 
And so I was like, all right. So I didn't get in. And so I went and I told my boss, yeah, I didn't get in. I'm on the waiting list, but uh, we'll just go from there. And he said, oh, man, you didn't get in? I was like, nope, didn't get in. That's okay. If God wants me in, somehow I'll get in there. And otherwise, it's not a big deal. He's like, oh, man, I really, really want you to get in. Uh, maybe I should make some calls. I said, no, you don't have to make any calls. It's just, we'll just see what God does. So a few weeks go by, a month goes by probably, and I get another email from the school, uh, Life Pacific University, and they say, hey, a spot has opened up, and we would love for you to be a part of this cohort. And so at that point, I went, okay, so this must be what God wants. And it was a huge surprise to me because I never really expected to get in. I had expected the first email. I didn't expect the second one. And so it was a huge surprise to me. It was a huge benefit, and I was really excited for that opportunity. And so I never expected that chance to really present itself, that I would be able to pursue my master's degree, especially in the manner in which that all took place. And so what I, what I learned through that and through a lot of other things in my life is that God is actually really good at surprises. God is really good at surprises. And just to name a few of the surprises that he brought about in, in that we can see in Scripture. The first one is that, you know, in, in reality, he chose a slave and a, and a, and a felon to save Egypt from famine. A slave and, and a felon. Now, he was a felon just because he was convicted of a crime he didn't commit, but he spent time in prison. In fact, right before he took the position of being in charge of all of Egypt, second in command only to Pharaoh, he came straight out of the prison. He was in prison until that point. So God surprises the world by choosing a slave, former slave and a felon to save Egypt from famine. Not a likely candidate, and that's what he does. But he chose an old woman to mother the son of promise from whom the people of Israel would come. So he could, I mean, there million, I'm sure lots and lots of people alive at the time of Abraham and Sarah. In fact, Abraham had already had a son with his wife's handmaid. God could have totally just done you know, what normally happens. Young women have babies, old women don't. But what does God do? He surprises everyone by, uh, by taking an old woman in her 90s and having the son of promise that becomes the father of the people of Israel come from her. Surprise! You're 90 and you're pregnant. That's quite a surprise. God's great at surprises. And he chose an old, or he chose a really young, unmarried, poor woman to be the one from whom he, God in the flesh, would come. Jesus came from, as King of kings, Lord of lords, God in the flesh, rightful ruler of all the earth and all creation, chose a young, poor, unmarried virgin woman to be the mother of himself, Messiah. God's good at surprises. He doesn't like to do things all the time in the same normal way that everybody expects, that we're all used to. Those are just a few of the many times that God has thrown humanity a curveball and surprised us all. And so today, we're actually going to look at one of the surprises that a lot of people miss when reading through Scripture. We're going to look at a time when God surprised people, surprised us, did things differently than what we would normally do, what we would choose to do if it was us, that a lot of times we just kind of breeze over. So let's take a look at Joshua chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. So you've already found it in your Bible, on your Bible app, Joshua chapter 2. 
uh, then you're in the right spot because we're starting right at the beginning. You don't have to scan down and, and try and figure out what verse we're starting in because we're starting with the very first one. We're going to read the whole chapter, so bear with me as we go. Right, it is a longer passage. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. States, Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Now, already we've got all kinds of craziness if you really analyze just this first verse. Okay, Joshua was one of 12 men that went in to spy out the land. How many of those 12 came back with a good report? Two, Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else said, we can't do this. This is horrible. This is a terrible idea. We cannot possibly go into this land. We will die there and die trying to take it because these people are huge. We're like grasshoppers to them. And then just to make things worse, it, the land really isn't that good. I think most of the part of them saying the land wasn't that good was just to convince people that we shouldn't try to get in there. And Joshua and Caleb were like, no, 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 the land is amazing. It's the best land we've ever seen. They called it exceedingly good in the translation that I'm most familiar with, the one I use on a daily basis. It's exceedingly good, and it doesn't matter how big these people are because God is with us, and if God says he's going to give us the land, then we're going to go in there and we're going to take it. It's fine. But the people faltered, and they said, no, 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 we can't do this, these ten guys. So what does, jo what does Joshua do when he has a chance to send in spies? He doesn't send in twelve, like he had seen done already previously by his mentor. No, he sends in two. He just sends in two guys, and he doesn't want them to inspect the land and kind of tell him how good it is or any of that stuff. He already knows all that. He's just sending them in for like a strategy report. He says, especially check out Jericho. Because he's thinking, this is the first place we're going once we get across that river. We're going to go to Jericho. So check out Jericho and see what we've got to deal with. And these two righteous, holy men of Israel go to Jericho and they find a place to stay. That is not where we would think is an acceptable place to stay in our experience, because they don't just go to some inn or find lodging with some random person in the area, in the city of Jericho. No, no, no. They go to stay with a prostitute. Now, immediately, most of us, if we said, you know, if I came back and I said, we had a great time in Sioux Falls, we stayed with this prostitute, you would have an issue with that. <laughs> it would make you very uncomfortable. And most of the time, we just kind of skip over that. But think about what's going on here. These are the holy people of God, and these two men go into a city and they stay with a woman of ill repute. Already, we should be on our toes wondering what is taking place. Verse 2, is told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. So they have been found out. They're supposed to be secret, kind of spies sneaking around, and they're not very good at it. They've already been discovered on their first night in Jericho, and people have told the king, Hey, Israel's got a couple dudes here. You need to know. And the king immediately responds, Verse 3, the king of Jericho sent to Rahab. They know where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be at Rahab's place. They're already in the city. Got to get rid of these guys. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. So he, he knows that Rahab has, has these guys in there or that they have come to stay at her place. And he assumes, basically, she doesn't know who they are. She doesn't know where they're coming from. She's just conducting business. And he says, just bring those guys out, and we'll take care of the problem. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So here are these two guys, enemies of her city, enemies of her country, and she hides them from the king. 
This is treasonous behavior. And she said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. Okay, the, we, the king already assumed that. He's good with that. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. So she totally lies. But she had brought them up on the roof, this is verse 6, and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So they closed the city down as soon as they send out these armed men to, get, to catch these two guys that have run away, even though they haven't run anywhere. And then they lock the city down just in case they're actually still inside the city. Verse 8, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord, or Yahweh, has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord, or how Yahweh, dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. She's like, your reputation precedes you. We know all about what's gone on with you since you left Egypt. You crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Everybody knows. Everybody knows you came into that land across the Jordan where the army is now, and you took out two kings and all of their country. You took over. We know all about it. So we're all scared of you. Verse 11, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For Yahweh your God, he is God in the heavens, above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord or by Yahweh that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and my mother my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So she's trying to make a deal for her own life and the life of everyone that she loves and cares about, all her family. Verse 14, the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window. For her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. So she knows this patrol that's gone out to capture these guys is going to search everywhere between Jericho and the Jordan and look for them and they'll give up probably after three days. So if they can just hide out long enough, they can keep from being caught. But if they get out too soon, then they're probably going to be captured and killed. So says, then afterward you may go your way. Verse 17, the men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of ours or of yours that you have made with us, or made us swear. Sorry. Verse 18, Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. So you're going to put a sign up in the window, basically, that says, Hey, this is my house. And this is your reminder about the agreement we have. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. So you're going to bring everybody in your family, everybody that you want to protect, into your house. 
That way, they can be safe. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So immediately she puts a scarlet cord in the window of her house, in the wall, where she let them down. To mark the spot. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. So they're looking, they're trying to find these two men that never even actually left the city before they did. They spend three days out there looking, they can't find anyone. So they returned to the city. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord, or truly Yahweh, has given all the land into our hands. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. So that's our passage today. That's what we're going to be reading. That's what we're covering and studying today. It's a longer piece of scripture, I understand. But in this passage, there are several surprises that I want to point out to you. Because I think they're really important for us to catch. They're things that we can learn from as we move forward in our study and in our relationship with Jesus. I want to point out just a few of these surprises. And the first one is this. Not everything or everyone is what they appear to be. Not everything or everyone is what they appear to be. We can come across people, we expect them to be certain things, certain ways. We come across situations or items, we expect them to do certain things or to be a certain way, to have certain characteristics. And we can find out later on down the road that that's not actually the case. So it's important for us not to make assumptions going into situations, going into meet new people. We need to be very careful about making assumptions. These two men, they go into Jericho and they stay with a woman who is a prostitute. That's how she makes her living. That's what she does to just take care of her needs. She is living a life that is not necessarily one that God would really honor and think is, you know, she's doing things that are not in line with what God thinks what God has stated is right. So they could have gone into that situation, found that they were welcome at her house, and yes, completely rejected it off out of hand because of her reputation and the life that she was living, the things that she had been doing in order to make a living. It doesn't look right that they go to stay there. These guys are supposed to be good guys. They're supposed to be upstanding men. They're appointed by Joshua to go into the land, so we know that Joshua trusts them. These guys are supposed to be good. How could they possibly be comfortable in a place with a woman with that kind of a reputation? What if everybody else finds out? That's the way that we tend to think. I can't go into that business. That business is known for these things. Oh, that's the kind of, this, I can't go in there because then people will think that I'm doing things I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing. These men could have thought that same way, and yet, that's not what they do. Instead, they go to stay with this woman that we oftentimes, as people of faith, as Christians, would just have completely rejected out of hand. We would have kept our distance most of the time from someone like Rahab with the reputation that she had. But these men go to stay in her house. That should surprise us. It should shock us. It should catch us off guard. And then, in the same situation, Rahab completely lies. Now, growing up, 
I had always come, I'd been taught in church, I'd been taught by my parents, lying is always wrong. Lying is always wrong. But here, Rahab lies, and it's a good thing? She did the right thing by lying? That doesn't fit with our moral kind of our, our ethic, our Christian ethic that we're taught most of the time. This is a situation where someone is completely deceptive, lies through their teeth. There's no element of truth for the most part in anything that she says, and yet she's actually honored for that. She's credited good things because she lies to the authorities over her. That, that should catch us off guard if nothing else does. How is that possible? Because lying is just wrong all the time, right? What's interesting is when we look at this kind of a passage, that's challenged. That idea is challenged. Now, I'm not saying that you should just go around and lie because you want to make people feel better, or there are all kinds of different times where you should just completely be dishonest at any point. But it is apparent from this passage that there is a time where deception is an acceptable and honorable thing. And that's difficult for us because we like the cut and dry, we like the black and white. This is right, this is wrong, that's how it works. This is right, this is wrong, that's how it works. This is good, this is bad, that's how it works. And yet, unfortunately for us in life, things aren't always black and white like that. Now, there are certain situations where that is true. But for the most part, it's very dependent on the situation and the consequences thereof. And speaking to a Rahab, and speaking to David Sadaka, he's a uh, a rabbi, he's a pastor, he's a teacher. He says it's evident from Scripture that there is such a thing as a righteous lie, and that's really tough for us because we look at the Ten Commandments, right? And it says, "Thou shalt not commit false testimony against your neighbor." But we take that and we say, "You should never lie. It's against the Ten Commandments." That's not necessarily really what it says. In this case, she lies her pants off and is, it's like, good job, Rahab. That's exactly what you should have done. And it blows us away. Because not everything or everyone is what they appear to be on the surface. So this should at least start, question, start causing us to question some things maybe in our own lives as we move forward. Kids, don't lie to your parents, okay? Don't lie to your parents. Don't think I'm telling you that at this point it's good for you to lie to your parents. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But I just want us to start to process the scripture in a new way. Let's really approach this passage with open eyes. Not everything or everyone is what they appear to be. The second thing is this. We shouldn't jump to conclusions about someone else's relationship with God. We need to be very, very careful about that. We're good as people at boxing people into categories. It makes it easy for us to begin to process things and decide whether or not we want to pursue relationship with people, to be able to kind of sort through things and box them into categories. That's why Rahab, being a prostitute, and these men of Israel going in to stay at her place, kind of, if we really process it, doesn't sit right with us a lot of times. Because we put Rahab in a certain box, and these men could have done the same thing. Okay, this is Rahab. She's a prostitute, number one. She lives in a Canaanite city that's totally messed up that we're supposed to take out where things aren't right. These people don't have any real moral values. This is not a good situation. This is definitely not a person we should associate with. 
She's a terrible person. She has no idea who God really is. It's easy for us to put that kind of a stipulation, that kind of a label on Rahab. Rahab, the godless, total, just idolatrous prostitute, and we discard her completely. It's very easy for us to do that. But here, let me, let me read a couple things for you in verses 9 through 11, okay? Let's take a look at what the Bible actually says about Rahab. So in verse 8, it talks about Rahab. She comes to the men that she's hidden on the roof to protect them from the king and the authorities in Jericho that want to kill them. And she says to the men, I know that the Lord, and she uses God's name. She says, I know Yahweh has given you the land. She knows who God is, and she knows what he's doing. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Verse 10, for we have heard that Yahweh, again she uses the name of God, Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. These men, these kings, were great kings of the Amorites. They were conquerors and they were massive giants physically imposing human beings. They were unchallenged by many of the surrounding kingdoms because of their stature and their military reputation and might. And these two kings are the ones that Israel defeated with God's help to take the land that now has been given as an inheritance to the tribe of Reuben, half the tribe of Manasseh, and the tribe of Gad. The place where all of Israel is currently living. She knows all about God's reputation and what he's done for the people of Israel. She knows his name. Verse 11, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For Yahweh, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Your God, Yahweh, is the real God. He's the real God, the living God. He's the one who's in charge of everything that's outside of our realm of existence and everything that's within our realm of existence. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? And who is saying it? Rahab. This horrible, nasty, dirty prostitute that comes from a pagan culture that's idolatrous and all these things that we've assumed about Rahab just because of where she lives and what she does for a living has completely been blown out of the water because of what she says. Rahab had absolutely heard about Yahweh and everybody in that area had. Because God's reputation had preceded him. Everything he'd done for Israel, all of that had made its way to the people in that area. But more than that, Rahab hears about what God has done. Hears about all that he's been doing for Israel. And what does she do? She acknowledges who he is. She knew and acknowledged that Yahweh was God. There are all these other gods. We know that. We, you know, we've got our gods here that we worship, you know, Baal and Ashtra, all these kinds of things. But your God, Yahweh, he's God. He's God in the heavens above and the earth below. He's the real God. He's the one that's in charge. He's the one that actually is the real God. That's what she's acknowledged. She has come to a place where she has begun a relationship with God, the real living God that you and I are learning to know and develop a relationship with in our day and time through Jesus. She has 
come to acknowledge that same God and begun a relationship with him, and we would have completely discarded her out of hand because of her reputation and where she lived and all the things that surround her life. She is a woman of faith in the one real God. So we shouldn't jump to conclusions about someone else's relationship with God. We, get, we put ourselves in a very dangerous position when we do that. We actually begin to assume God's position when we take that role. We need to be very careful with that. Not everything or everyone is what they appear to be, and we should not jump to conclusions about someone else's relationship with God. Next thing I want to point out is that sometimes confirmation of God's will comes from very unexpected places. Sometimes confirmation of God's will comes from very unexpected places. The people of Israel are in a place on the other side of the Jordan where there is still a level of uncertainty. They have been where they are now before. They've been there for years. They've heard the stories about how their parents came to this point. And they were going to cross over the Jordan and they didn't do it and they didn't take over, and they wandered around for a little while before they came right back to this same spot. I'm certain that it's possible that these men may have had doubts before their mission. They may have been some people who were not real clear on what God really was going to do for them, and thought, you know, we've got this land. We already took out these two kings and these groups and the Amorites. Why don't we just stay here? We're good. We got, we got space. We got land. Why, why do we need to go across the river? They could have been very comfortable there. They had cities. They had lands. They were with their family. Everything seems good. It's a nice place for livestock. They're all pretty familiar with livestock. They've been shepherds and, and cattle herders for a long time. This is before they went down to Egypt. We know that because that's what they told Pharaoh they did. Oh, we're, we're shepherds and keepers of livestock. That's what we do. Like, this, this is a great spot. This is great ranch land. Why should we move on? What's the point? Why do we need that over there? We got plenty of space. So these men may have had doubts before their mission. And yet Rahab's words... And actions increased their faith and determination. She says, hey, God, God's given you the land. Everybody here is afraid of you. Our hearts melt before you. Everything is, everybody's scared out of their minds at you and what God has done for you to get you to this point. Everybody is freaking out. Everybody is scared. That's enough to really strengthen these men's faith. Now they know exactly what's going on. So when they get to Joshua again, days later, they say, hey man, this land is ours. Verse 22, they departed, went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. So they get to Jericho they're there probably for a night, let down from the window, stay in the woods for three days, and then go back. So it's probably been three, four days since they left, at least, from Joshua. So the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Verse 23, then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. So they go back across the Jordan River. They go to Joshua and they told him all that had happened to them. So they just, they recount the whole story. Hey, we stayed in this house with this lady Rahab. We made a promise. She has this red cord in her window and she has her family in her house that we won't touch anybody in her house. Everybody's okay there, but we're good to go with the rest of it. So he gives, they give the whole breakdown. Joshua debriefs them, kind of figures out what's going on. And then verse 24, it says, They said to Joshua, Truly Yahweh has given all the land into our hands. This is a huge statement. Because they've been really to one city. But they say, Truly Yahweh has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. 
They're all afraid of us. God's definitely give us all the territory, and those people know it, and they're scared to death. This is great. They're ready to go. Just like Joshua and Caleb were. They are ready to go. And why are they ready to go? Because Rahab told them, hey man, we're all scared of these, we're all scared of you guys. We know what God's done, how he took you across the Red Sea on dry ground. We know what he did in, in giving you the king and the Amorites, the kings of the Amorites and, and all that territory. We know what God's done and we know what's coming. The minute you cross that Jordan, man, we know we've got no chance. We're all aware of who, how great your God is. We know. We're all scared out of our minds. Because she had told them that, their faith was encouraged. Their faith was strengthened. They were better equipped for the mission ahead. And we need to be aware that that happens. God does that. Sometimes confirmation of God's will comes from very unexpected places. They didn't expect Rahab to strengthen their faith. They didn't go in there thinking, man, I hope there's got to be somebody here that's going to really crush all our doubts and put us in a place where we're just ready to go. God, we really need that. Con they didn't go into that situation like that. They did not expect Rahab to do anything that she did probably. And yet she protects them. She hides them. She encourages them by telling them all about what they all know about God and that she knows that God that they serve is the real living God over all of creation. And that strengthens their faith. So again, not everything or everyone is what they appear to be, both good and bad. And we shouldn't jump to conclusions about someone else's relationship with God. It's a dangerous place for us to be. Sometimes confirmation of God's will comes from very unexpected places. You know, I don't know, maybe you've noticed some of these things before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe some of this is kind of new. Maybe you've just been surprised by what we've talked about today, the things that have come in there. Hopefully, there was at least one new surprise for you in what we looked at today. Hopefully, there was at least one thing that caught you off guard. You're like, oh, wait, and it got you thinking. In any case, whether or not that's true, I hope that what we've been able to learn today will help us all as we move forward in our relationship with Jesus, in our journey of faith with him, that it will strengthen our faith and our understanding of God as we move forward together. So today, I want us to pray that we can really be open to God and the surprises that he will bring our way that we'll be open to what God is doing and the surprises that he brings into our lives as we continue to walk together through the coming days, the weeks, the months, whatever God brings us through together and however he may bring others to join us, that all of that, that we will just be open to God and the surprises that he has in store. So let's pray. Father, I know that uh, there are very different views among us on surprises some of us are big fans of surprises we love that kind of an idea because we've had really good surprises at times in our lives and we remember those things and we we are we get excited about those kinds of opportunities where things may exceed our expectations or where lord something comes along that we didn't expect that is going to be a huge blessing for us and then god there are those of us who are on the complete other end of the spectrum who have been completely blindsided many times and have had a lot of negative surprises in our life and it's it's been difficult for us and so we really aren't fans of surprises we'd rather have the information ahead of time we'd rather just know what's coming and be able to prepare for it and get ourselves mentally emotionally physically lord and in all other ways ready for whatever is coming and lord no matter where we fall on the spectrum between those two extremes Lord, I pray that as we move forward in our relationship with you, from wherever we are, that we would be open to the surprises that you bring into our lives. 
Lord, that we would trust that because you are love, because you are good, because you are faithful, because you are just, because you are right and righteous, Lord, that the surprises that you bring into our lives will be for our good. That even when we don't understand them, and maybe they don't look good at the, on the surface, that ultimately, in the end, Lord, you will bring good from those things because you have promised to do so. You say in Romans that, Lord, you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so, Lord, when we are surprised, when you throw us a curveball, when things aren't going the way we expect, we know we can still trust you. And so I pray, Lord, that our faith would grow deep enough that we actually do. That we really do trust you, even when we are thrown a curveball we didn't expect. Lord, I pray that we would be open to you and we would allow for you to move us and direct us through times that are both comfortable and uncomfortable. As we walk with you, Lord, that our relationship with you would grow and be strengthened. And that we would be bright lights for the world around us. Lights of hope, lights of love, lights of truth, lights of full, abundant life. So that the world around us can see you in us. That your kingdom, Lord, would grow and expand because of our influence on the people around us. As we live our life with you allowing you to influence and change and direct us through each day. Amen.